Hello, and welcome to our podcast for the University of Utah Press. My name is Hannah. I'm the marketing manager for the press. And today I have Lori Bryant, author of A Modest Homestead, Life in Small Adobe Homes in Salt Lake City, 1850 to 1897, which was published in February of this year. Welcome, Lori. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Hannah. I'm glad to be here. Oh, good, good. Uh, Lori, um, from what I understand, you used to be a paleontologist. So I'd like to hear just a little bit about your journey from paleontology to Adobe Homes and what sparked your interest in vernacular architecture and, ho- and these houses specifically. Well, I think once a paleontologist, always a paleontologist, it, it's hard for me to pass up a, a television show or a Facebook post about bones. <clears throat> so I still go there. Um, on the other hand, I've always been interested in anything old. Old things um, tend to have secrets that make them mysterious and make them seem to need investigation. So as far as the owners of and designers of vernacular houses go, they very rarely kept records of their work or their plans. Um, and so there was everything to be found out. Very little known, nothing to find, or everything to find out. And when I retired, (laughs) I started to look closely at buildings in my own neighborhood, because there are a lot of old ones up there. And that led to my seeing Lorenzo Dow Young's house on Harvard Avenue. It's had some odd additions, and really I had no idea it was an adobe house until my friend Alan Barnett pointed it out to me. Then I was hooked. Oh, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, so why do you, what do you think architecture makes such a good way into the lives and histories of ordinary people? Well, everyone sends messages about who they are and what they're connected to through their dress, their speech, and often their homes. Uh, today, that message from homes is often based on the house size. But in early Salt Lake, building materials sent that message too. So until a railroad got to Salt Lake City in 1870, there just wasn't any efficient or cheap way to bring in materials like stone and lumber. So adobe was the default for everyone. People could afford to, yeah, they'd add some decorative touches and they'd built homes in in, uh, particular styles. But everyone else built just enough to provide shelter. I wrote about those people because no one else had coalesced their stories into a narrative. Yeah, that's good. Um, So building off of that question, um, you mentioned the railroad coming in in 1870. So can you trace this cultural evolution that happened in Salt Lake where Adobe went from being considered a useful and central part of material uh, to a cultural representation of the lower class to actually being banned as a material. Yes, um, it's a really interesting way of looking at uh, the evolution of building materials uh, to see them from the standpoint of the arrival of the railroad. It did play a major role in in the demise of Adobe. First, because the railroad brought in timber and mill equipment to cut it into lumber. And that was a first for Salt Lake. Uh, it was a very long hike or ride to go to the hills, find trees, cut them down, cut them into movable pieces, bring them down to Salt Lake, cut them into lumber, and so on. But once the railroad arrived, trees could be cut, let's say, on the north slope of the Uinta Mountains brought here, cut into lumber uh, with lumber mill equipment that the railroad brought in, and and then you could build houses with lumber. You could build houses with longer rafters and longer ridge poles so that the houses themselves were bigger. 
The railroads all also brought lumber and coal or wood and coal that could be used to fire brick furnaces and make fired brick, a real improvement over adobe. And by 1870, or after 1870, rail lines extended all over Utah, and they brought in stone uh, as well as other materials for people who could afford it. Part of the cultural change away from adobe was the realization that the millennium, which had been expected, the end of, of the physical world, had not come. And people began to settle in for the long haul. Better buildings were, were part of that philosophical shift. Adobe homes became objects of derision as Salt Lake City prospered. And banning them was part of the cultural evolution in what was called the Progressive Era. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. So they weren't banned because they were unsafe? No, I don't think so. Uh -huh. uh, they simply were part of the past, and Utah was moving forward. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. So you mentioned uh, in your book using the Sanborn fire insurance maps for Salt Lake City to locate many of these adobe homes, especially ones that have been remodeled and might otherwise be difficult to identify. But you also mentioned spotting adobe buildings the Sanborn map overlooked. So how did you train your eye to find these buildings, and what are your main visual indicators? First, I would say that my, my initial approach would be to look at building size and type. Most of the adobe buildings that are still left in Salt Lake City are little, maybe two rooms what's called a hall parlor. Second, I looked at the foundation. Uh, many of the older and smaller adobe houses have simple field stone foundations, rock that you could pick up anywhere around the Im immediate area. And some have red sandstone, not cut, but simply laid up. Um, as they had arrived on a, on a wagon from a quarry. And third, maybe the easiest of all, is to get a close look at the window and door frames. Those are always about 15 inches deep because adobes were so big. And then to do what I did, knock on the door and chat with the owners. They almost always know what they have. Uh, that actually leads into my next question perfectly. Um, so I attended this lecture you gave to the, for the King's English at, at the 15th Street Gallery, which was very interesting. And there was someone sitting in the audience who owned and was remodeling an adobe house, and he seemed really excited to talk to you and show you his home, um, which I don't believe was discussed in the book. And I just thought that this was so neat that your book is reaching out to, to everybody so maybe besides that story, what were some of the best stories you encountered while writing this book? Oh, I think the two best stories were finding that the George Edward Anderson house on Third Avenue. He was a pioneer Utah photographer. Um, and this was his childhood home. Uh, to my knowledge, it had never been identified specifically, but through title searches and other kinds of information, I found out that it was indeed built by his father. The owners allowed me and, and my colleague Tom Carter inside, into the cellar, upstairs, everywhere, so that we could see what material, materials were used, how it had been built, everything. It was a dream come true. Unfortunately, Ed Anderson's life in that house wasn't a happy one, and that's part of my book. Huh. And another house on 700 North had a wonderful story. It was about an English pioneer woman of 1853 who helped her husband build it in 1855, and then the next week, I'm sorry, and then the next month, buried her first baby in the backyard. That led to finding her journal, the original, transcribing it, and meeting her descendants at a lunch they arranged for me. They brought family pictures, 
uh, that dated back to the time of Savage and Ottinger, the 1870s, uh, wonderful things. That, that's interesting. And another uh, story is uh, when John Alley, who acquired this manuscript, um, was looking through it, he found his, I'm going to get this wrong, great-great-grandfather's land plot in it, in one of the maps you had in it. So I find it interesting how far-reaching this book is. It's there is a lot that can be taken away from this book. Um, it can be a socioeconomic study. It can be a geographic study. Um, as you say, it can be a study of land distribution patterns. Uh, that early map that was made of Salt Lake City showing which pioneers received which lots. Um, and that, that information is still preserved at places like the county recorder's office so that you can find out exactly who owned your property and when. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, can you talk about how the environment of Salt Lake City influenced both the architecture and demand for adobe homes? Well, Utah had an early reputation as a very harsh place. No one else had settled here. Nobody wanted to. So when the Latter-day Saints chose it in the 1840s, it was in part because of its isolation and its disconnection from the rest of the United States. That meant that the settlers were also isolated from the material goods that they used to have access to. And the labor involved in going to the mountains, as I said, to cut trees or haul stone, that just meant that Salt Lake had to be built of something else. And as it turned out, that something else was mud from the many creeks that came th across the valley because all of them had floodplains, wide areas where the creeks fanned out and deposited mud. And that mud turned out to be an excellent material to pack into wooden molds and then turn them out to dry in the sun. There was an endless supply of mud. But the pioneers didn't build what we might think of as the southwestern style adobe house. They brought style with them. They were in an unfamiliar place. They had almost nothing in the way of material possessions to comfort them, to make this place home. But what they did have was the idea of architecture and design that was comforting and familiar. And so that's what they built. They built homes that looked like the ones they had in the Midwest, in upstate New York, in Ohio. So how many adobe houses are remaining in Salt Lake City? At the last count, after I watched one go down in January, there were 193 remaining homes. But that's out of thousands of original buildings. If you think of this as an adobe city, this tiny little remnant, that's all we have left. And I think we should hang on to it very tightly. So it, it's about time for us to wrap up, but before we go, I'd like to know what you would like to see happen to these adobe houses that are still standing, that are still around? Well, I guess you're going to have to call me something of a fanatic, because I'd like to see every single one of them preserved. To me, what's unique about Salt Lake City is that it's the only city in the United States, the only large city, that began as an adobe city. The buildings that remain out of thousands that used to be here are integral to our heritage, and they're still functional. All but a few are still lived in today. I'd like to see owners in the, in the first place take responsibility for preserving these homes because it can be done. First, don't let anyone tell you that, the, that your house will collapse in an earthquake. They're still standing, aren't they? 
And actually, those that I've seen demolished don't come down easily. The bricks don't crumble, and they don't even break very easily. And there is help out there. There's help from, let's say, the State Historic Preservation Office. You can call them or visit at the Rio Grande Depot. There's things like tax credits and easements to help offset the cost of repair and improvement. And there's housing rehabilitation programs. Find out if your house is on one of the historic res registers. Talk to Preservation Utah. They have loan programs. Or just contact me. I'm always ready to help, and I'd love to see your house. <laughs> Thank you very much. This has been Laurie Bryant with uh, the University of Utah Press. Thank you. You're welcome.